Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's a tough spot to be on right after lunch and following a coach of a Ivy League uh, university. But uh, I was asked to give an overview talk uh, about how livestock uh, production uh, interacts with the, the whole realm of climate change and how we're doing, really, how we are doing today. Uh, because there's a lot of public interest as to what the impact is of our food, of our particularly animal protein on uh, environmental resources. Many people believe that animal agriculture has a profound impact on our climate. We heard earlier today uh, from Bill that there are numbers out there uh, floating anywhere from 18% to 51% that people believe livestock contributes to climate change, to greenhouse gases, uh, not just globally, but also in this country. And uh, quite frankly, uh, data are whipped until they are confessing, and uh, I am increasingly tired to read articles like the one last week in The Guardian uh, that quoted almost 20% of uh, impacts that livestock have on climate change um, and, and other papers of that sort. Uh, but we all play a role in it, and we all play a role in how we respond to it. And so I'm very, very happy to see that Kurt and others have put together this conference and that such an uh, interesting and profound group of people have followed the call. So I live in California. I'm at the University of California in Davis. And what you see here is basically a satellite image of California. Let's see if I can shoot right here. So this is San Francisco here. This is Davis down here, Bakersfield, Los Angeles down here. And what you see is uh, the interesting topography of uh, the Central Valley with the Sierra Nevada on the east side, the coastal mountain range on the west side. So this topography here really ensures that any kind of pollutants that are generated in California and also coming in from outside California get trapped in this large valley here. And so I'm an air quality specialist. I deal with all of those impacts that all sources of society and all sectors of society have on our air and of course also uh, on our climate. So I will not talk about air pollution today but uh, greenhouse gases but uh, this is just um, to exemplify how big a problem this whole issue is in California because what you see here uh, as this milky stuff is not snow or something of course it is smog and here in Fresno, California in the heart of the dairy industry of our state, we have the worst air quality in the United States. That's followed by Los Angeles, and that's followed by Houston, Texas. So not just do we have these pressures on our natural resources, uh, not just do we have a lot of people, around almost 40 million people now, but we also have a lot of people who um, want to know where their food comes from, a lot of people who think they're experts as to where their food comes from, and uh, indeed very, very few of them actually are but they have strong beliefs and they exert a lot of pressures onto the legislature and so on. So uh, I deal with all different kinds of sources, uh, agricultural emission sources. Uh, some of them uh, are uh, not even in our state and not even agriculture, but other emission sources. You see here uh, a map of California and those black lines here uh, are not, or what they are, are container ships uh, burning a lot of um, uh, crude oil, and that pollutes a lot of our air. So it's not just the traditional sources that you think of, like cars, trucks, factories, and so on. Oftentimes, it's even sources uh, beyond our legislator, uh, our, uh, our, uh, our enforcement capabilities, and in many cases, they even come from across the ocean. In fact, our prevailing wind comes from the west, and therefore, about 10% of the pollutants that we inhale in California uh, originate in China. But uh, this is what people see. They see, uh, well, this is what you see here, a fence line on the one side of the fence. You see a thousand happy California cows. On the other side, a thousand happy, unhappy California residents who had uh, decided to move there uh, for very good reason. The reason being that uh, land was cheap to buy. Uh, but guess what the first cause of action of these people was? You can guess to sue the dairy, and uh, that's what happens. And that's what happens increasingly often, and I'm really tired of it. This is a very poor example of land, uh, land use planning that we see happening quite often now in our state, but also in other states, and resulting lawsuits are of great concern, of great concern. 
Now, this is not what I'll talk about, but uh, just wanted to give you a little background. This is what I will talk about, facts and fiction in and around livestock and, and climate change. So you hear all of these things being raised in the media frequently. Uh, livestock producing 80% of all human-caused greenhouse gases, livestock producing more greenhouse gases than the entire global transportation sector, livestock producing more than even these 18%. Some people say as much as 51% of greenhouse gases. And then always the, uh, the claim that organic or extensive systems are better than intensive systems producing less greenhouse gases. So my talk will um, t touch some of these issues or all of them. The mother of all publications that started this whole discussion about the magic 18% number was this one here, a United Nations FAO report, Livestock's Long Shadow, that claimed that 18% of all global greenhouse gases stem from animal agriculture and that this is a higher share than transportation. Our work had shown that uh, there were some methodological flaws in this work and um, that the com particularly the comparison of livestock to transportation was a flawed one because different methodologies were used, life cycle assessment in the one and only measurement of direct emissions on the other. The FAO agreed with our criticism, but that number continues to be around the media, continues to be in use. This is a global number, 18%. And I want to emphasize a global number. And when you generate a global averages that summarizes 200 countries, then obviously you have uh, both sides of the spectrum. For example, in, uh, in the United States, and you will see this in a few minutes, the uh, uh, the EPA, but also the USDA, estimates about between 3 to 4 percent of all greenhouse gases to stem from livestock. 3.4 is actually the number. In Paraguay, where I lived for a year, it's 50 percent, 5-0. Why is it 5-0? Why is it 50? Because they have twice as many cattle as they have people. In a place like Ethiopia, it's 90 percent, 9-0. Why? Because very little transportation, very little industry, but a lot of livestock. So if you now take 200 countries in the world and generate one average, then obviously that average looks high. I cannot get our media in this country to understand that a global average must not be applied regionally because it will be wrong in Paraguay, in Ethiopia, and in California or elsewhere in the United States. You have to look at the regional uh, specifics if you want to get it right. But here's the point. Many of them don't want to get it right don't want to get it right. So this uh, original work has led to a lot of not just public policy decisions, but also really practical um, food chain um, decisions. For example, this one here, this is a photo taken from Sweden showing three burgers, a tofu burger, a turkey burger, and a beef burger. And these blue uh, bubbles associated with these three burgers are not the price tags, but the carbon footprints. So people in Sweden now make their buying decisions not just based on price, but also based on things like carbon footprint. Uh, Toyota and many, many other companies have jumped onto the train to compare livestock uh, in all its forms to their products. In this case, a, car, a Prius. You see here uh, a, a scale of how green uh, the sheep is versus the Prius. Obviously, the Prius has to be much greener. Um, not too long ago, I watched a show on TV, and I was pretty shocked. My wife said, did I just hear that? And I said, yes, I heard it too. She said, uh, the moderator on this show said, and I quote, he said, if you drive a Prius and you eat one burger a week, then that's the same as driving a Hummer. And he added, and that's according to the United Nations FAO. So I scratched my head and thought, where in the world might he get that from? And he got that from Livestock's Long Shadow, from the comparison in the executive summary comparing livestock to transportation, saying livestock has a greater impact on your carbon footprint than your transportation choices. So um, then I went to the EPA, I went to the USDA and asked them for all the different sectors of society and what their contributions are to our carbon uh, footprint as a nation. And the numbers, and I don't just want to bombard you with numbers, but numbers matter in this discussion. The numbers are the following. They say, the EPA says, energy production and use in this country contributes to 31%. Transportation, cars, trucks, trains, planes, ships, uh, 26%. And all of agriculture, a little bit over 
and animal agriculture around three and a half, approximately three and a half percent of the total. So three and a half percent for animal agriculture, 26 percent, which is a quarter, for transportation, and 31 percent for energy production and use. So why am I telling you these numbers? I'm telling you those numbers because in our media, people keep making those claims that our food choices are the uh, most important determ uh, determination, uh, or the, they are the greatest uh, determination of what our carbon footprint is. And they insinuate that transportation and other choices don't really matter. And that is misleading the public. Misleading the public in a great way that is contrary to really reducing our carbon footprint in this country. And to this industry, I want to make the point that you better wake up to that because if nobody else does, then this industry will be bruised badly. I am originally from Germany and I can tell you what I see there, and I just came back last month, was shocking to me. There's a huge wave of people who say, not just other vegetarians, they are vegans, okay? And they are vegans because of this issue and because of the, the animal welfare issue and because of the fact that nobody really responds to that and, uh, and rectifies it. It's not just us scientists who, are, uh, who have to respond to that. It's also the government that needs to respond to that. If there are emission inventories, why not sharing those with the public in ways the public understands? The public wants to know. The public wants to know. I teach a class with 300 undergraduate kids from San Francisco, Sacramento, uh, and so on. And these kids want to know where their food comes from. And they Google it, and the only answers they get are those from PETA and HSUS and so on. And I don't think that that's in the best interest of this industry. Okay, I'll come down my soapbox now, but I'm very passionate about that. <laughs> so this year is not new to most of you, which, are, which just shows three of the greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide, and how they differ in what's called the, the global warming potential. This basically just means that methane is 20, 25 times worse than CO2. Nitrous oxide is approximately 300 times worse than CO2. And uh, animal agriculture, of course, produces both methane and nitrous oxide. Why am I showing that? I'm showing that to exemplify what I said initially, namely that people whip data until they confess. A so-called World Watch Institute, which is an offspin of a few former World Bank employees, took those numbers and they said, no, we don't agree with this physical law, basically, of the global warming potential of these gases. We believe methane is not 25 times more potent than CO2. They said it's 71% more potent. They're the only ones in the world claiming that. Yet if you do that, if you change that factor from 25% to 71%, then livestock's impact to our carbon footprint in the United States is indeed 51%, more than half. And these people who made these claims were given a one-pager in the New York Times by Mark Bittman. And nobody responded to that. And millions of people read it and now think what they think. So this is, this is why I'm saying numbers matter. We need to pay attention. We need to respond to these things. Because uh, otherwise, uh, if nobody responds, they are just... Uh, viewed as being true. So here's what most people in this country and throughout the world think are the main contributors to greenhouse gases. Uh, you see on the, bottom, on the bottom panel here the years 1750 to 2000, and the blue line indicates when throughout that period fossil fuel was burned. Fossil fuel, of course, being coal, oil, and gas that was stored in the ground for hundreds of millions of years that has since been extracted to a large extent since 1960, about half of the fossil fuel has been taken out of the ground. So that carbon was taken out of the ground where it was hundreds of millions of years, and throughout a very short time period, it has, it has been burned. And now that carbon is where? It's in the air. Okay? It's that simple. That's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, why fossil fuel use is viewed so critically by those people who say that, that uh, humans have a high... Uh, contribution to climate change. And many people in agriculture refute that and say, it's not true, humans don't have an impact on climate change. We don't want to hear about it, we don't want to be bothered. But believe me, society wants to hear about it, and you're part of that. They will ask you, what is your contribution, and what are you willing to do about it? 
This slide here is taken from the EPA emission inventory. It's now a little bit uh, old. It's from 2009, but uh, the overall picture is the same. It shows on the x-axis the years 1990 to 2008. On the y-axis, the total amount of greenhouse gases and CO2 equivalents. So what the EPA says is that the vast majority of, uh, of the carbon footprint is associated with the use of energy, fossil fuel. That's energy production and use and transportation. And up here, this gray area here, is agriculture. That's the combined impact of animal and plant agriculture. So again, approximately six, some say closer to seven percent of the total. What's also oftentimes not discussed, but I'm, I was glad that Bill mentioned it this morning, is that there is a, uh, a large area south of the x-axis which shows that there is sequestration potential of different sectors in society. And the only two sectors of society that can sequester carbon are agriculture and forestry. Yet these are the two sectors that regularly don't participate in all the climate change negotiations because many of their representatives just simply don't believe in it. So it kind of drives me a little nuts, but it's important for everybody to understand that the two industries that can reduce greenhouse gases are those that we are dealing with, agriculture and forestry. So uh, this number up here, the 6% or 6 or 7% of total agriculture is an important one for all of the people in the room, of course. Let's just assume for a second that the beef sector in the United States produces approximately 1.4% of total greenhouse gases in the United States. Again, all of animal agriculture is 3.4 or so. Let's say beef is 1.4%. And let's say that all these people who proclaim that Meatless Monday would save the climate were right. Let's just say 300 million Americans would stop eating beef on Mondays. Then we would reduce 1.4% of the total carbon footprint for beef by a factor of seven. That's a reduction of 0.2%. That we would reduce greenhouse gases if all Americans would stop eating beef one day a week. Is that a profound reduction? I don't think anybody here would say it's profound. It is a reduction, but it's a minor one. Compare that to 26% contribution of our transportation choices. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what drives me crazy when I hear people like Bill Mayer saying what he says, namely that the Prius plus the burger equals the Hummer. Now nobody cares about their transportation choices anymore. So we have to pay attention to these things. The FAO, who I have been critical with at the beginning, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, had a, a very important goal in mind when they wrote Livestock's Long Shadow. And the goal is the following. I know everybody in the room has heard of the 2050 challenge, which is to how to feed this growing human population in the years to come. But I really want to make it more explicit. This slide shows in the x-axis the year 1750 to 2050. When I was a little boy, and I'm in my mid-40s, when I was a little boy, we were at 3.5 billion people. Today, we are at 7 billion people. When I'm an old man, we'll be at nine point something billion people, meaning throughout my lifetime, throughout our lifetime, human population on this planet will have tripled. And that's a take home I really want everybody to take away from this meeting. Human population will have tripled throughout our lifetimes. And that's particularly happening, and here you see in the, in the third world, in developing countries, so emerging and developing countries, and not so much in the developed world, which is uh, here marked in, in yellow. So a tripling of human population. Where do all these people live? Well, I love this, this, this slide because it shows uh, something very nicely, a circle. And inside this circle here in Southeast Asia, there are more people than the entire rest of the world combined. And every 10 years, they are adding the population of the United States to that circle. So there is a huge, huge number of people that lives in that area. But the increase in human population, you will ask, where does that occur? Well, it occurs here. 49% of the increase in human population will occur over the next 30 years in Africa. So about half of the global population increase will occur in Africa. And 41% in Southeast Asia. You see North America has a slight increase. South America, 7%. Europe is shrinking, but this is where the music plays, in African countries and in Southeast Asian countries. And so for people like us who are interested in how to 
reduce the impact of the livestock sector on climate change, we need to think about how do we do that in the emerging world and how do we do this in the developing world? How do we help them to reduce the impact they have? Because we already have a very low environmental footprint of the livestock sector in this country. 3.4% is an impact, but it's not like 50% or 90%. Uh, the numbers I quoted earlier today for Paraguay and Ethiopia. In those developing countries, the consumption of animal protein is increasing. Whether it's eggs or meat or milk or whatever it might be, they are all increasing, as this graph shows. Um, this increase is largely driven by incomes. On the x-axis here, you see the per capita of national growth income. On the y-axis, you see meat consumption per capita. And so you can see we are here. We are pretty much the richest, and we eat the most meat. And the same is true for dairy production and so on. Europe is somewhere up here. China currently is down here. But make no mistake, very soon China will be up here. No doubt in my mind. They have already doubled their demand for animal protein within the last 10 years. The number one fast food chain in China today is Kentucky Fried Chicken. So this is where developing, developing countries are, and this is where a lot of the focus of the FAO and others lie in, and uh, for good reason, I might add. This slide was taken from, from Livestock's Long Shadow from the FAO report. It shows where in the world we have livestock, and while you might think that we have a lot here in the United States, with respect to total numbers, that's not true. We don't have large herds here but there are very large herds in other places of the world, particularly here in India and in China. This is probably one of the most important slides I will show you. It shows where in the world we have land to feed people. Whether you want to grow crops or animals, those areas here in color are the only areas where you can do so. And whether we have three or seven or nine or 12 billion people in the world, that's the only area we have to feed these people. And I really want that to sink in with everybody in the room. We have a tripling of human population throughout our lifetimes, but the resources to feed these people are not tripling concurrently. They are staying stagnant or they are decreasing. And that, ladies and gentlemen, leaves us with an ethical choice to make. How do we feed this growing demand, not just for animal protein, but for food globally? with a situation where today we already have one billion people acutely starving. Today, one billion people acutely starving. Every day, 25,000 kids die from hunger. Not just a number, that's not a statistic. It is a statistic, but it's more than that. We have another billion people living off less than $2 a day, also partly starving. So with seven billion people today, we already have two billion who are either starving or close to, go to getting there. And while we are having this dire situation today, we are adding another several billion people to that picture. And while we are having that situation, we have people who say, the way we produce food here is totally wrong. We need to go back to the 1950s, 1960s. We need to have farms with 100 chickens and 10 pigs and 15 or 20 cows because everything else is not sustainable. I hope everybody in the room is clear about that. That is a almost consensus in large parts of our population, that they think that intensive large-scale production is the wrong thing to do. We need to go back to where we were. The vast majority of people in this country and in the Western world are very, very critical about how we produce food, whether we like that or not, but they're critical. They are very critical about the use of technology. They love technology when it comes to health. When they have a headache, they pop a pill. When they have a heart attack, they put a pacemaker in. But guess what? They don't like any technology applied to their food. Why? Because technology use has never been explained to them. They don't really understand what technology use in agriculture means and why it's important and why it's essential in order to feed that growing global need for food. Without it, we will not be able to meet those needs. Yet the population out there has no clue about that. They have no clue about it. 
This slide here shows, again, from Livestock's Long Shadow, developing regions versus developed regions in the world with respect to greenhouse gases, as you can see from 1990 to 2020. In the developing countries of the world, greenhouse gas emissions go up, while in developed countries, they are stagnant. And they are stagnant uh, despite the fact that production has increased and increased dramatically. So this slide here is one of the very important ones. It came directly from Henning Steinfeld, the senior author of Livestock's Long Shadow. By the way, the reason why I keep talking about the FAO is because I now work a lot with the FAO on a uh, benchmarking project to assess the impact that livestock has on the environment. Um, so this slide came from Henning Steinfeld, and it shows on the x-axis the output of dairy of milk, fat and protein corrected milk per year, so from a low producing cow here to a high producing cow here, uh, and the carbon footprint basically on the y-axis. What it shows is that a cow that's low in production, that that cow has a very high carbon footprint. The more this cow produces, the relatively lower is its carbon footprint. Basically, if a cow produces at this level, she's, she's fed something like maintenance requirements. She's been kept alive, and she can breathe, and she can keep her temperature up, but she doesn't produce a lot of milk. The more you need the nutritional needs of that animal, the more milk you will get from this animal. So it shows the relationship between total, in this case, greenhouse gas emissions and milk output per cow. The FAO, after uh, publishing Livestock's Long Shadow, um, put teams together to look at different commodities. The first one was dairy, the dairy sector. And they looked, how, looked at how different parts of the world and the dairy sector in these different parts of the world differ with respect to greenhouse gas emissions per unit of fat and protein-corrected milk. Not surprisingly, North America was the lowest of all regions with respect to the carbon footprint uh, of milk production. Now, in the United States, just to use some round figures, we produce approximately 20,000 pounds of milk on a herd average per cow per year. It's more, but let's just say 20,000. Just across the border in Mexico, the average there is 4,000. It takes five cows in Mexico to produce the same amount of milk as one cow here. And if you look further globally, let's say India, it takes 20 cows there to produce the same amount of milk as one cow here. And that has a profound impact on the environmental footprint of dairying in these different regions of the world. Because whether you produce with one cow a given amount of milk, or with five cows, or with 20 cows, has a huge impact on water use, on land use, feed use, on enteric gases coming out the front end, of total waste production, and so forth. That is now something broadly understood. The FAO understands it, all the membership uh, countries that I have been engaging with understands it. The livestock sector has understood that for a long time, but the consumer has no clue about what I just said. No clue about that. They do not make the link between efficiencies and what efficiencies mean on the one hand and what that, how that relates to environmental quality, to environmental footprint. They do understand it if you use an analogy, which is transportation. When you tell them, Imagine uh, driving a car with, one, with a single occupancy versus putting five people in there. Which one has the lower carbon footprint? And then you expand that to a bus or to a train or other transportation choices. People understand that, but they don't make the link between efficiencies in transportation to efficiencies in food production. Yet they will have to understand that because that's the only avenue, the only venue forward to feed this growing global demand for food. Improving efficiencies across the world, not by making everybody look like the United States, but by making everybody understand that that is the only key forward to improve their situation in whatever country they might live. This is another slide from the FAO. It shows ruminant meat, dairy, and non-ruminant meat in different regions of the world, indicated by different colors per unit of uh, output. And you see, again, the US in blue here uh, ranks very well when you compare it with different parts of the world. So these are emission intensities. So um, I think there's a pretty broad consensus now in the circles I, uh, I deal with that there's a concert of tools needed in order to get us where we need to go globally. And that concert of tools improves reproductive efficiency, veterinary care, 
improved genetics, and the use of more energy-dense diets. This concert of tools will lead to a situation where we will decrease the number of animals to produce a given amount of product. A few beef trends um, in the United States, and then also uh, one from China, uh, a few livestock trends. In 1970, we had 140 million uh, uh, beef cattle in the United States. Today, we have 90 million. But even though we have so much fewer animals today, we produce the same amount of beef. On the dairy side, today we have 9 million dairy cows, 16 million fewer than 1950. But even though that's the case, we are producing 60% more milk. 60% more milk with so much fewer cows. The carbon footprint of a glass of milk is two-thirds smaller than it was 70 years ago. And what we see, this journey that we have seen occurring in this country over time, is a journey that we now need to see spatially. We need to see that those areas in the world that are very low in production efficiencies, that they grow very fast. Because that's the only way for them to satisfy their nutritional needs. And they will do this while shrinking their herds. They have to do it while shrinking their herds. The same is true for the pork industry. Here you see the years 1965 to 2013, and you see the total amount of, um, of product produced uh, throughout this, this time. So you see production has more than doubled over the last, what, 50 years. More than doubled. And it's still going up. I mean, it's just uh, an incredible success story across livestock species in this country. Now, one example from China. Uh, as you know, they are still claiming to be a communist country. They certainly still have their five-year plans that uh, come up with policies. The most recent one uh, spoke out about livestock, and they said they want to make farms larger and more efficient. Today, there are 1.3, well, 1.3, between 1.3 and 1.4 billion people in China, and they have 700 million peasants. 700 million small-scale farmers in China. The public policy in China is now to move those 700 million peasants from their small-scale plots into cities. They won't get rid of small-scale agriculture in China, by and large. They call this process citification. And they want to move their industry, their agricultural industry, very close to where we are in this country here. Half of the world's pigs today live in China. They are producing one billion pigs a year in this country. One billion pigs are produced in China per year by 50 million sows, each producing 20 piglets. So a, st a staggering number, but nothing uh, compared to the next bullet point, which is that of the one billion pigs they produce, they have a pre-weaning mortality of 40%. They are losing 400 million pigs pre-weaning in China. Can you imagine that happening here? Anybody losing 40% of their crop? That would be unthinkable. Now think about all the resources that go into the raising of 400 million pigs. That's a larger crop that they lose than what we produce in total in this country. A huge loss of resources in that country. And that's China. That's not India. That's not Africa. That's a developed country compared to many of the other developing ones. So this is just an example of how uh, poor the, the resource use occurs in, in, in countries that are still developing. And again, this is China, this is not Africa, where uh, in many cases the cow uh, is not really, or the steer is not there to be slaughtered uh, by the end of the year or in two years or three years. They're basically the piggy bank of the family. And they live for a long, 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 long time, for 20 years or something. And then they fall over one day, and then they are eaten. But they are not really produced in order to provide food at the most efficient rate to a group of people in, in many, many cases. So I thought that was a good example to contrast what, what we have found here. Now, when I heard that the Chinese bought Smithfield, I at first wondered, why would they do that? Uh, and now I no longer wonder. They just want to speed up the process of Conver converting what they have currently to what we have here. And that's how they do it. And 
Some of you will say, well, this is uh, competitive to us. Well, on the one hand, it is. On the other hand, a lot of this aspect is really pre-competitive because if livestock production is, is viewed globally as very resource-hungry and largely due to the fact that it is resource-hungry in large, in large parts of the world, then that's uh, a black eye to everybody, including people here. So I think they have to learn, and they have to learn very fast in countries like China, India, and others. So um, a term that's often used now is sustainable intensification. What that really means is intensification is a term that I think everybody in the room here can, uh, can relate to. But it's not just to get animals to be more efficient and to, be, to produce more optimal rates, but it's also doing so uh, keeping other sustainability areas in mind. Sustainability areas including, of course, food safety, Food safety, of course, is paramount. Animal welfare, another sustainability area, paramount, particularly to people in the developed world uh, who very much have that in mind. Environmental quality is another one. Another one often overlooked is worker health and safety and worker training. To keep and retain a competent workforce is, at, is, is the root of sustainability, oftentimes totally ignored. All of these factors combined with profitability are uh, what I define as sustainability. And I think sustainable intensification is really something that people in this country, in the Western world, but also internationally, can relate to. We have done a very, very poor job explaining how food is produced in this country to our people, who in increasingly want to know. We have not done a good job. We have oftentimes been very defensive when the media asked questions, uh, and that has not been helpful, because the other side has not been uh, away from the media, but they have informed the media and they have given interviews and so on. So now we have a situation in this country where we really have a picture that we should be proud of, yet the public believes the opposite is true. And that needs to be reversed fast, very fast, with all players on board, whether it's government or industry or whether it's educators, we need to educate our people and tell them how we produce food, why we produce it the way we do. Uh, if we have problem areas, we need to address them aggressively. If you are a farmer and there's a certain part of your farm you don't want the public to see, guess what? Then you might have to, to do something about that because they are your clients, they are your customers. So today I hear people like Henning Steinfeld and others say production intensity enhances biological efficiency. And production intensity and emission intensity are inversely related. Production intensity and emission intensity are inversely related. And while that might make sense to most of you in the room, it does not make sense to most people outside this room. And I think that's a message that really has to be communicated very well. People have to understand that what we're doing with the Prius is a great thing. But guess what? We can do something like that with our livestock species too. We can make them very efficient. And that efficiency will directly translate in how they impact the environment. So, and with that, um, I have a few minutes left for questions and I'm happy to entertain any, any questions you might have. Thank you very much.